Hi, listeners. With this episode, we have a little external noise for the first 10 minutes or so. Um, my dog really wanted to come in the room because Barbara and I were sitting in the room and she was really quite jealous. So she's scratching at the door and whining. Um, I hope you're patient with that because we let her in and then all was good. So thanks again for joining me. And I'm always so grateful. Hi, I'm Meg Michelson. Welcome back to Soul Speak. In today's episode, I would love to introduce you to a dear friend of mine. Um, boy, I might even get a little teary. <laughs> Her name is Barbara Steffen, and um, we met, I don't even know, a year or two ago. It hasn't been that long. Oh, we met through Jen. We met through Jen yeah. Hellman, who's another dear friend Mutual of our friend. Mm -hmm. And um, we just had an immediate connection and a beautiful friendship. So um, Barbara is also, at the beginning of every episode, that beautiful voice you hear. She's a composer and a songwriter, and she's also a voice coach. Mm -hmm. um, so today we're going to talk about, with Barbara, that journey of when we connect to our soul, how that happens in our lifetime, and the journey of that reconnection in and out, because that's pretty normal for all of us. And Barbara's had a pretty fascinating life. So Barbara, if you would introduce yourself and just talk about your life a little bit. Sure. Yeah. Well, um, as she said, my name is Barbara Steffen. So uh, I I grew up in a small town called Afton, right in between Beloit and Janesville. I'm not sure if you're familiar mm -hmm. with that. There's a sign that says unincorporated. It's like less than 100 people. It was very, very small. So um, we moved there when I was three years old. And uh, I started going to church there in the little town at five. And uh, they, I think I, I might've been like seven or eight years old when I realized that people were looking at me like, oh, like you can, you can sing, like you have this talent that you have. Um, and so they put me in the adult church choir uh, for a while, which I, which I, you know, stayed in until I was like 15 and then I left church, but I'll get into that in a second. So yeah, I wanna say, um, there was a lot of, I, I'm going to, I'm going to say, first of all, like my parents and I have an amazing relationship and, uh, man, it was, it was rough. It was rough for a while. So we're talking, you know, seventies and, uh, I felt very much as a kid that, so I, I looked up to my dad, like he was God, you know, and he was like the number one thing in my life. And in an effort to kind of protect me from the world, um, he was very, just like everything that I wanted to be, which is I wanted to be an artist, I wanted to be a singer, I wanted to be a songwriter, I wanted to be, you know, all of these things. And he wanted to make sure that I understood that in the big wide world out there that there was no way I was going to be able to achieve these things. He didn't want me to go out into the world and fail. He didn't, you know, he wanted to protect his little girl. And for him, that was his way of loving me. And for me, it was, it was very confusing. Now I, I loved my dad. We had a lot of fun. Our family, we had a lot of fun together. And I came out of that environment with such disastrously low self-esteem and low self-image because everything that I was and every, everything that I wanted to be was just kind of squelched down and, and pressed down. So, um, and, and his intention was to protect you. His intention was totally pro to protect me. Yeah. So we had that conversation years after the fact. Um, I, I was in a lot of counseling. I did a lot of seminars, you know, I was just trying to, I felt like I was trying to claw and scratch my way back to some sort of self self esteem you know to to understand like where i had lost myself you know completely and i remember i ca i called him and i asked him why like he was so discouraging of my dreams and then we just both started crying he was like i wanted to protect you i wanted you to understand like it's a big bad disappointing world out there so i didn't want you to go out there and and have the disappointments that that i had so um, yeah, I, and our relationship is just so good now. So I, I didn't want to open up saying, um, you know, it was, it was such a difficult time, but yeah, you know, realistically, I think we all go through these challenges 
in childhood. And that's the, that's like the story. That's the hero's journey. You know, I was just reading, oh, you're going to find this fascinating. Mm -hmm. We talk a lot about archetypes, yes. right? And that we live Barbara in these, and I talk a lot yeah, about we do. We uh, like, we live in these archetypal energies, you know, king, queen, mother, father, child, victim, fool, magician. And at, at any, you know, time in our lives, we're kind of tending towards one energy or the other. And I just lived in victim tendency for so long because uh, I was so angry, you know? And then I, I just heard lately that not only do we live inside these archetypal structures, but we also, the actual hero's journey story is an archetypal structure. Yes. The, um, the flow of a story. So there's the protagonist. Um, the protagonist wants something. The protagonist can't get what they want. So then it's going through all of these trials and tribulations to get what they want. Yeah. And, you know, you try this and that doesn't work. And then you try that and then that doesn't work. And then you try that and then that doesn't work. And then finally, after growth and maturity and all of these things, then, the, then how does the story end? The story needs to end with transformation. That's ultimately what we want as spiritual divine beings. We transform ourselves as humans to embody the divine nature within our, within this avatar, within all of the cells in our bodies and these challenges. Um, and I want to interject in the yeah, heroes please. with the hero's journey on the archetypal, beautiful soul level is we have to go on our own. We have yeah. to leave wherever we are, whatever that tribe is. So we can find ourselves within. And so that hero's journey is, so key to the development of our connection to our soul life. Mm -hmm. And, um, and some people go on the hero's journey, not even realizing it and never come back. However, ideally right. we come back to our tribe. We go and we learn and we learn how to grow up and become independent without trying to please. Yeah. And then we come back with an ability to merge in healthier ways without right. having our self-esteem taken down. Right. And it's kind of like if you think of a slingshot and you, so you have the slingshot and the rubber band and you are stretching that, that object that you're going to, you know, slingshot at somebody. Um, and the, and the further back the rubber band is stretched, which is, you know, the, the greater the struggle is that we undergo when that object, when it's finally released, then it's, it goes so much farther. Yes. And so when we think, when I think about my struggles and I remember, uh, when I first heard someone say to me, oh, well, you pick your challenges. And I thought, oh, and you pick your parents. I was like, I did not pick my parents. No, I did not pick my family. There is no way. Um, but now I, now on the other side, I can look back and say, okay, like, that's why I needed to go through all of that. Because I mean, once you go through something like that and you find your way back to spirit and you find your way back to self, there's no shaking that. You, you, you can, there is nothing that can happen then that rattles that inner knowing or that, or that inner love for yourself. And we can be rattled though. Like we can absolutely be rattled. But once you get to that core concept of, oh my gosh, I am bigger than this human lifetime. Mm -hmm. And, and I love talking with Barbara about this. We go on walks and just yeah. talk about it because we both have this same underlying feeling that. We are bigger than our human story mm -hmm. and we wake up and we have hard days and yet we can get back because, oh yeah, that's right. We're bigger than our human story. Mm -hmm. And when you go on the hero's journey and you come back home, nothing can stand in your way anymore. Nothing. No. Yeah. And when you understand that you're living the hero's journey yes. and you can kind of disconnect yourself from the elements of the story and, and look at, is it at it as a story? Um, that's, that's also really helpful. At least, at least for me. Yes. It's like, Oh, I am, I am in this stage of the hero's journey and, th and that's okay. And these are the you players know? and these are the players People that are ruffling my feathers <laughs> <laughs> as much as we would like to get rid of them. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and sometimes we have to get rid of them or, or exit ourselves. Yeah. And sometimes we just look at it differently and it's so much less painful. Yeah. It's all of a sudden, ah, vision yeah. again. Mm -hmm. And so when did you start to discover that you were 
um, or I guess I would say, when did you start to look at your life from that symbolic lens? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh yeah. I I love this, this part of the story. So um, I, so growing up in church, you know, I always knew that that was not for me. I didn't leave church feeling empowered. I'm speaking for myself. I did not leave church feeling empowered. I did not leave church feeling good about myself. I didn't leave church feeling like I was closer to God. Um, I just left church feeling like, oh God, thank God that is over. Now I can go home and do what I would like to do. Um, and you know, just not, not living in any kind of a spiritual environment, um, feeling very unsafe, feeling, um, very lost. Um, but not even knowing that I felt like just living with this horrible anxiety, you know, day in and day out. And of course this is, um, a time where, you know, going to therapy wasn't, there wasn't a therapist on every single corner, no. nor there wasn't a spiritual no. center on every corner or a yoga center on every corner. And it wasn't accepted. Really and it that wasn't that. accepted really. So, so, so I did go through a lot of counseling, but again, it's just, it was just very heady. There was really nothing spiritual about it. So I was working jobs I didn't like, and I would go to school and quit school and go to school and quit, quit school. Of course, thinking that like the things that I wanted to do, I wanted to make my living as a musician. I wanted to make my living as a singer um, or in a writer and just really believing in my heart that I, I was not, those things were not available to me. That was not going to be, that wasn't for me. That was for other people. So I worked in jobs I didn't like. Um, I went to school doing things and I'm like, you know, it, it never lasted because it wasn't what I really wanted to do. So, um, so then I, and then I got married because he was a nice guy and that's what you do, you know, at this age. And I was like 30 too young to get married for me. (laughs) I didn't know myself at all. So that marriage lasted exactly 10 months. And within that 10 months, I just started to have this awakening. And it was, it was so awful and embarrassing and painful for me after 10 months to be like, Oh my gosh, I, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know who I am. I'm like, I'm so sorry. Um, and, and he was devastated and my parents were devastated. And like, I just left a wake of devastation. We were in a band together and then the whole band hated me. And then everyone stopped talking to me. It was very difficult. However, I met a woman who was so deeply spiritual. And when I announced that I was going to leave my husband that I just married and I was just looked like a wackadoo, you know, she was like, come, come and live with me and my daughter. So I did. And that changed everything. Yeah. Oh my God, I could cry. You can cry. And that, when you look back last week, I talked about belief. We have to have a belief that gets deep in our system in order for us to move into it. And you got to that point. Mm -hmm. I believe in, I have to go. I believe Mm -hmm. in me more than I can do this. Yeah. And then it got stronger because you did it because that was a big, huge risk. Yeah. A lot of people stay and then they right. become more depressed and live oh, gosh. in a puddle. And so when you had that strong belief mm-hmm. that you had to, this wasn't going to work. And all the people that were telling you, what? You haven't given enough time. And yeah, but your core said, I can't. Yeah. And I had one person who believed in me. Everyone else, my friends, I remember my, my best friend at the time, Marcy, she, this was unforgivable to her and she just dropped me like then we were no longer friends. And so just, yeah, to just have nowhere to go, no one, like everybody would just dropped away. Um, that's by far the hero's journey, by the way. (laughs) Yeah. Right. I know that now, Mm -hmm. but that back then I was like, I'm losing my mind. I'm crazy. This is the most horrible thing I've ever done to anybody in my life. Um, so, so living with her and then she introduced me. Okay. So one of the turning points was she took me to an Abraham book club and it was the ask and it is given book, um, by Esther Hicks, Esther and Jerry Hicks. And I read the first page and I had never heard these words before ever. You are a divine being. Your birthright is love and acceptance. You can be yourself. Like your authentic self is so powerful and you are so loved. Like the universe loves you. 
you know, it didn't talk about God or being a sinner or being, you know, anything. I was so filled with awe because I'd made it to 30 years old and I'd never heard these words before. I didn't have that self love. It had never been reflected to me. So I didn't know that it was in there. And I, I grabbed onto that book. Like I was dying. And on an older astrological model, about age 30, that you've fulfilled one life cycle. Okay. So that's when we start to say, wait a minute, mm-hmm. I'm going to look back now. Yeah. And, and there was, for me, when you say it was about 30, all of that time period, yeah. 29 to 31, you were meant to have that discovery. And you were yeah. meant to say, I am living with all of this stuff on my back. Yeah. That's not me. Right. So right. I got to start throwing it off. Yep. And it's hard. Making yep. those decisions are very hard. Yep. But it takes way more confidence in whatever is out there. I have no idea, but I know this isn't working. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And one of my saving graces and, and my dad, um, he put me in his van when I was 13. And I am forever, forever grateful for him for doing that for me. Um, it taught me so, 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 so much. I mean, it's been 40 years, just about 40 years. I'm going to be 53 on October 3rd. Yeah. So having that experience and all of the ups and downs of that, um, you know, and then I was always in a band, like even when I felt so discouraged, even when I was at my lowest point, I was like, this is something that I can do. This is something that I know how to do. Um, so I, I always had a little combo and then I started to join like bigger show bands and things like that. I, I I desperately wanted to do it for a living, but you know, it was just at this point a hobby, you know, so I'd work a 40, 50 hour work week and then work all weekend long playing in bands. Cause that was my, my outlet. So you didn't give up on your dream. I didn't give up. I didn't no. give up. And then around 31, 32, I met, uh, Ellen McDonald, who owns, owns Heartland Music, and she saw me performing at a club. And she came up to me and she said, have you ever thought about teaching what you do? And she's like, I, I own this conservatory. We only have classical opera voice teachers. Um, you know, we could use someone like you. There's a lot of people who want to sing pop and sing rock. Um, and I said, well, I don't have a degree in voice. And she's like, who cares? Like, it doesn't matter. If, yeah. if, if, you, can, if you can teach someone, to sing, if you're good at what you do, it's like, no one's going to ask you. And during that time, did you feel fear? Like, oh, oh my I was God. terrified. That's right. I was freaking terrified. And you did it anyway. I did. That's right. I was, it was terrifying. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Yeah. A full-time job, yeah, absolutely. insurance, I had benefits. And again, another point where people are like, you're crazy. You know, I didn't know anything about, t- I had been trained. Um, I had wonderful voice teachers who had transformed my voice, but I didn't know if I could teach it to anybody else. Um, so she, I mean, I, so after the audition process, um, they, she put me on the faculty list and I was like, Oh, okay, here we go. And I, and I quit my job and I, and I never looked back. It took me maybe a good five years. And I kind of wish I would have known this before beforehand. It takes a good five years to establish, to, to establish yourself in a new venture and a new business. Sure. And I spent that whole five years like, Oh my God, you know, is the rent going to come in this month? Is the rent going to come in this month? You know? And then, um, yeah, just, just, I didn't want to hurt anyone's voice. I didn't want to yeah. give any misinformation, but yeah, I, I was kind of a natural at it. And that is, so the voice is the fifth chakra mm-hmm. and the fifth chakra is surrender and it's also the number five is freedom Mm. and freedom isn't always easy we (laughs) have to bring ourselves and take those physical steps and take those risks so we can feel free and it doesn't mean we feel free every day because oh my gosh how am i going to pay the rent right and then we get back on that train and do it anyway yep do it anyway right because because in the society and the culture that we're living in this is, um, you know, you're on the fringe if you do that. It's getting more so now, but 20 years ago when I was doing it, you know, to, to go into this self-employment route, again, all these messages, you're crazy, 
You're never going to make it. It's not going to happen. And now, and now that I know what I know, there's a ton of ways to make a musician in this world, you know, to make a living as a musician. I I wrote some film film and television music. Um, I released albums and of course, you know, I, I perform like crazy and my life has been an amazing journey in that way. Um, just to show myself that I, I could do these things, um, just with the intention and then, you know, the right people show up and the right circumstances show up. And, and that's key. Yeah. So when we are talking about living a soulful life and having faith and not having faith, there are signs. And, and we've talked about this in other podcasts. There are always signs and they're always earth angels. There's always people. Mm-hmm. And we want to trust that we yeah. take those opportunities even when it scares us, because mm-hmm. when we take the opportunity and another opportunity comes yeah. when you moved out of your marriage mm-hmm. and that home, you had an opportunity, a woman took you in. Yeah. And then when it was time again to stretch yourself, to now take your voice and bring it to others in a different way, mm-hmm. help them, mm-hmm. another woman, whether or not it's a woman or a man, yeah. stepped in and said, hey, by the way. Let's do it this way again. Yeah. And then you take the risk. Yeah. So it's those, those are signs. That's connecting to spirit. Yep. What was the belief inside of you? So when you were afraid and you did these things anyway, mm-hmm. what was going on inside? How did you get the movement to really replace the fear? <laughs> well, um, honestly, when I first started out, to, to make my living as a musician, it was 75% F you. I'm going to show you that I can do this. It was a lot of, I had a lot of anger um, and, you know, injustice. Sure. And um, I was, I was bound and determined to prove these people wrong who said I wasn't going to be able to do it. And then, you know, I had to, I had to let that go. You know, it was a driving force. It, it drove me. Um, I was practicing like a crazy person. I was, you know, I'm going to be the best I can possibly be. I'm going to show them. I'm going to show them. I'm going to show them how wrong they were. Okay. Well, that's not the right energy. That's a difficult energy it to, is. to live in. It, I mean, it is, except that was the impetus. So it was. on that, um, we talked about a different episode, that um, emotional vibrational scale. And anger is in, in kind of the center, a little bit below the center. Mm-hmm. Better to have anger than apathy because yes. anger is here to tell us my life isn't right. Right. And it is the force we can use to make our life right. Yeah. And a lot of people ingest it and then it eats them up inside and causes a lot of internal inflammation. Yeah. Or we say, I'm going to use it to propel me forward. Mm-hmm. And ideally, right, you you do that with your own inner being. However, yeah. you used it to yeah. get you going. It was the fire starter. Yeah, it was the fire starter. Exactly. So, um, so then of course, when I, when I met my friend Lois and moved in with her, um, I, I just, it was a long period of dismantling all of that blame and victim archetypal energy that I was swimming around in. And then of course being introduced to Alan Watts, um, Terrence McKenna, Ram Dass. I mean, I, again, I, I grabbed on to these teachings Like I was like, I was out in the middle of the ocean dying, you know? Um, And my heart started to soften and I started to just kind of let that go. And then now I am in such a place of pure um, love for what I'm doing without any of this. I have to prove anything, you know, that I'm, I'm so angry with you. I need to prove that I can do this. Now it's just a pure, um, this is such a joy in my life. And I love to share it with other people. And that was just such a, again, to go through the struggle and to come out the other side is just so, it's so much more meaningful, you know? And I'm going to go back to the fifth chakra because Mm. being a singer and a voice coach and, and you involve way more than the the fifth chakra, but you just said, now it's so pure. Mm -hmm. that's the transformation. That's what you just did with your fifth chakra. The Sanskrit word, um, if if we um, translate it to English, is pure. Really? Yes. Okay. So it's surrender, freedom, and the ultimate goal is 
this is my center of pureness. Mm -hmm. I won't let anyone block my soul Yeah, because it comes through the seventh, down the sixth, down into the fifth. And this is where people get stuck or we surrender and we can get to that place of, it's not about making other people wrong. Yeah. Right. It, it can't be. It, well, it can't and be. we go through the stages. Yeah. Because at first we can make people wrong. Yeah. I'll show them. Right. And that's part of the growth. And then we get to that place, hopefully on that journey of soul to body that we now do it because it's right for me mm-hmm. and it feels good. And yeah. I'm living my life in a pure, authentic sense. And that's a beautiful connection yeah. to spirit. So, and this is why I believe thyroid problems are so prevalent in in our society. So when I was um, 14 or so, my thyroid started to show some signs of being a little wonky. And by the time I was 21, I had had to quit performing because I shook so bad. I had so much adrenaline. My thyroid was so enlarged. I had hyperthyroidism. My resting heart rate was 160 beats a minute. I thought there was something wrong with my heart. I was terrified to go to the doctor. Um, I couldn't keep a job. I had horrible migraines. I mean, I was a mess. I was an absolute mess. I'm, I'm not going to lie. And what age was this? 21. 21. Yeah. I want to say I was, I was pretty much a mess from like 14 to maybe 30. <laughs> you know, yeah. it was, it was very, yeah. very difficult. But, um, and now what I think is such an archaic practice and I'm going to just, I'm going to beg anyone listening to this with thyroid, thyroid problems to please try any other avenue than the radio iodine treatments. Just, just try anything else. Um, they completely decimated my thyroid gland. They gave me way too much radio iodine. They were just supposed to shrink it a little. And, and I've been living without a thyroid gland since I was like 22, which is a whole nother subject of, yeah. of, of issues. Yeah. Yeah. But my thyroid, my, my throat chakra was so blocked. I was so repressed. My authentic self was so, stuffed so far inside myself that my my whole area it was just like zzz, it was just so out of balance and out of whack. And um, I've talked about that. The thyroid is all about communication and our life force and mm-hmm. living our authentic self. And um, I also have hyperthyroid, which is oh, um, and I have corrected mine with meditation yes and healthy eating um yep. and and of course i'm not saying you, you everyone should do what's best for them Agreed. always and if you can learn to live with healthy communication and healthy eating habits and learning stress management because we're always going to have stress yeah it provides at least more support yes to this system so then if you're on thyroid meds those thyroid meds are going to work better yeah, exactly. Because yeah, I'm living a healthier life. Right. I'm not saying ignore your doctor. No, no. But I am saying that's, I think, a pretty medieval way to yeah. treat thyroid issues. Yeah, I think they do that less now. Um, I hope so. But I, I worked with a, I, I, I bought a book and worked on my own with this woman out of Texas who's, yeah. a, who's a physician. Okay. So um, when you look at your life now, um, because you believe in magic. You oh, yes. You both believe in Woo-hoo. magic. And, do um, I? I know. And it's, it's wonderful. Yeah. It's wonderful to believe because there's so much we can't see. Yeah. There's right. so much we can't see. Right. When you felt like there were times when you were, now you've gotten to that place in your life where you feel that pure connection. Mm-hmm. And there's days that are a little scary. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you get back to the magic when you feel like? Mm-hmm. You've lost it. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, it cannot be overstated that meditation is is really the key. Um, and I was thinking about when I got your questions the other day. I was like, wow, what does like what does magic mean to me? Like, how do I personally define magic? And for me, magic is so when you're watching a magician, you know they they're they're transforming something like they. They have an object, they're either making it disappear or they're changing it into something else or um, it's, it's, a, it's a transformation, right? So magic means to me, when, I am, when I'm shown the proof from the outside world 
that I am in communication with creation. That is, that is magical to me. So like, I know I've got this, I know I've got this going with creation. Like we're in sync, we're in flow. Um, meditation puts me back in flow. Singing puts me back in flow. Doing chakra opening techniques puts me back in flow. But it's like, I'm playing and communicating with this force, this mind, this, this energy. Like we, I don't know if people understand, we did not create the world. Human beings did not create this place. Yes. Human beings did not create human beings. We are not our own creators. There's a mind and an existence and an intelligence that has loved us enough and loved itself enough to want to explore and experience all these different facets. So when I am shown something like, oh my gosh, I'm always picking up my phone and in that moment, it's like 11, 11. 11, 11. I look at the clock. It's one, one, one. I mean, that's like my thing. Right. Um, or I have another faith in the signs. That's yeah. Faith in the signs. Yeah. Or I had an experience. I was in Jamaica with a friend of mine and I, I sometimes play with spirit and say things like, okay, spirit today. Um, I, I would like to see a yellow bird. I would like something about a yellow bird to show up in my, um, you know, and I'm in Jamaica. So, you know, seeing a yellow bird might not be right, you know, too far out of the realm of possibility. However, and this is, this is the magic. This is how I know I am playing with an intelligent, incredibly creative, um, mind. So later on that day, and I'd completely forgotten about my yellow bird request. I'm laying in the sunshine. It's so beautiful. I am just, you know, laying there. I'm so relaxed. And I hear from down the beach, a guitar and a voice. So there's a Jamaican man walking down the beach playing guitar for the resort guests, you know, collecting tip money and, and whatever else. And as he gets closer, he gets closer. I realize he's singing Yellow Bird. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, thank you. Yeah. You yeah. know, yeah. that's magic. That's magic. That's magic. That's, that's those unseen forces mm -hmm. that we can't say they're not there. Oh, no. Because we don't know. No. There's so much we don't know. And when you are bringing that into your everyday experience, mm -hmm. you've now gotten to that place where you bring that into your everyday experience. Yeah. And yeah. do it for play. Like, okay, I want to see a yellow bird. Mm -hmm. And do it when we need a sign to get us to where we need to be because yeah. we're feeling fear. Right. Or uncertainty, mm -hmm. um, starting a new venture. And then we might ask for more signs or yeah. bring the right people in. Yeah. No, that's where you have partnered with the divine energies, the intelligence of the universe. Yeah. However we name it, you've partnered with it. Right. And so do you ask like for the signs, do you also throughout your day ask for bring me the right people mm -hmm. help me with this? Oh yeah. yeah. And then it's like, um, and as you know, like clinging and attaching yourself to whatever outcome you think should be like that, that's got to go to, I mean, I'm, yeah, that's, absolutely. that's another journey yeah. of just letting go. And it's like, you know, okay, this or better, this or better. Um, because our, you know, creator knows our hearts, um, better than our human minds can. And whatever I'm thinking about is, is not going to be probably as it's, you know, it's never as good as what creation can, can come up with for me. So and it's just kind of letting go of those outcomes and then it can be just pure play. Well, show me, you know, show me what the next step is going to be. Um, and then you always talk about following the nudges. You know, I feel that like, call this person, um, call that person, you know, explore this idea, explore that idea, um, write that down. Um, get on the floor and, and do some down dog right now. I mean, there's just little pushes, go for a walk, uh, go play with your dog. Um, go balance your checkbook, you know, I mean, cause it's always speaking to us, but I feel like they're nudges that come more from the heart than, than the thoughts that yes. I'm thinking this blah, 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 yes. blah. A absolutely. This chattering going on. It's not on a there. have to. No, it's different. The it's nudge different. is you're not, overthinking about something. Oh my gosh, I have to do that. I have to do that. I have to do that. Yeah. That's 
not the nudge. No. The nudge comes from inside, right? But that's what we're trained to do. That's right. This is why the hero's journey here in this incarnation is so freaking difficult. Yeah. Because we are trained from the get-go, most of us yeah. are trained from day one, um, even in our mother's womb, you know, absorbing her energies. And um, I, I remember seeing Bruce Lipton talking about, you know, nature is so brilliant when we're in our mother's wombs, we're, we're absorbing all of these energies so that we can understand as a being, what, kind, what are we incarnating into so that we know how to survive, like right from the get-go, which is good. Um, and it, your challenges are already right there. That's right. The challenges of your That's whole right. life, the day you're born, That's right. they're in you. It's already written. It's already written. And you look at the stars and you can reset immediately, mm -hmm. but it's already, look at the stars, it's already written. Because we see those stars that are not even in existence anymore. Yeah. If you're any, if there's any parents to be out there, any pregnant um, couples or singles, start early. Yeah. Let your child, when you're yeah. in, when they're in your belly, talk to them about the magic. Bring them, raise them with the magic. Yeah. Raise them with anything as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. you weren't raised that way. No. But you you fought your way to get there. Mm -hmm. You fought your way to get there. Yeah. Yeah. What would you say to the audience? Anything you want to, and anything else you want to say? What else did you not say? What else did I not say? Mm -hmm. Well, you got another question on there, like, what does faith mean to you? Yeah. What and does faith mean to you? I think that um, if I think about the deepest, darkest hole, I've ever been in. And I heard, if I, if I heard one phrase that was like a pinpoint of light, it, it's just holding on to that one pinpoint of life, having light, having faith that it will grow. If you just hang on to that one statement, that one thing, you know, that we all kind of glob onto when it is the darkest, darkest, darkest that it can possibly be. Um, I, I remember hearing phrases and hearing things, especially, you know, the Abraham book, like the first line of it, like you are a divine being. It was such a pinpoint of light in that dark hole. And I just held on to it with faith that the light would now become more of my experience than, than the dark. And you weren't attached at that moment to your external circumstances. You were connected to something outside of you, mm -hmm. outside of this earth. Yes. Like even for that one tiny little moment. That's right. Yeah. And that's, and that's having faith, you know, you're in a dark hole and you have to have faith that the light is going to be turned on at some point. That's right. And isn't that, and that's a scary journey, but isn't that also the most beautiful journey? Yeah. And then nothing can take us down. Nothing can take that away. No. No. Nothing, nothing can take that away. Thank you. Thank you. What a beautiful experience. Yeah, this is fun. So this again is Barbara Steffen, um, a dear friend of mine who will always be We'll always be connected. In this <laughs> yeah, I, it was. Yeah, I mean, our instant yeah. connection was so beautiful. Yeah. We sat down at dinner, and it was like, blah, 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 blah. it was great. <laughs> yeah. And um, so I, I check her music out because she's an incredible woman and a musician, and how she brings her voice—not only the voice of her music, but helping people understand. They can follow their dreams mm -hmm. and it is not an easy journey to follow our dreams all the time, mm -hmm. but damn it. It's worth it. It's oh, worth it. so worth it. So worth it. Yeah. Thank you very much, Barbara. Thank you. Mike. And I hope we'll do this again. All right, let's do it again. <laughs> Have a great week and I'll talk to you next Wednesday. Hey listeners. Thanks again for joining me. If you want to learn more about me services, I offer who I am please check out my website, megmichelson.com. Also there you can join my newsletter. I do a, the best job I can to send it out monthly, no guarantees. Follow me on Instagram and YouTube. Thanks again for coming. I'll see you next time.